live from Chicago, Illinois, it's theCUBE, covering Veeam On 2018. Brought to you by Veeam. Welcome back to Chicago, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage, and we are covering Veeam On 2018, hashtag Veeam On. My name is Dave Vellante, and I'm here with my co-host, Stuart Miniman. Duncan Epping is here, Chief Technologist, Storage and Availability at VMware, and the world's number one blogger in virtualization, Yellowbricks, yellowbricks.com. Duncan, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Good to no, see you. No problem, my pleasure. It's been a while. I, uh, I actually hoped to be on the show probably six, seven, eight years ago. I don't know how long it is, but um, I've watched many episodes, so it's great to be part of it. Well, great. Well, one of the biggest problems, you you're so busy. Yeah. You know, every year at VMworld, you, know, you, were, you were totally booked up, so no, thanks, thanks so much. We're so glad we could do this. So no Stu problem. and I, I remember the Peer Insight we did you know, many, many years ago, back when, well, so we had Ed Bunyon on recently, and he was talking about when, when VMware sort of created virtualization, it, it push the bottleneck around, it created a lot of stress on the storage systems. And then VMware for years dealt with that through API integration and the like, and very well sort of covered. But I wonder if you could take us through your perspectives of the journey of storage at VMware and generally, or specifically in virtualization generally. Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, everyone that has been part of the community has faced all of the different challenges from a storage perspective. I mean, Stu, you know what kind of problems EMC had when VMware first started uh, doing virtualization, and I think the key reasons for these were fairly straightforward. Uh, when we started virtualization and we started leveraging uh, shared storage systems, those shared storage systems were never designed with virtualization in the back of their minds. They were designed for physical workloads, maybe one, two machines connected to it, you know, in larger environment, maybe 10 or 15 but not 10 or 15 physical hosts with hundreds of virtual machines. So what we started noticing is that from a performance perspective, systems were lagging, uh, we were doing all sorts of different things to the storage systems that they weren't expecting, virtual machine snapshots, uh, they were seeing I.O. patterns that they had never seen before instead of sequential I.O. We had a lot of random I.O., so we had to start doing different things from a storage perspective. So as you said, we started with APIs, we had the vSphere APIs for I.O. filtering, uh, we have the uh, Devi uh, APIs, the uh, array integration, so that we can offload some of the functionality. But of course, uh, on top of that, what we started doing within VMware is we started exploring what we can do smarter from a storage point from our stance. So not just looking at how we can help the ecosystem, but also uh, what we can do from our perspective. So there were two main efforts over the past couple of years. Uh, the first one is virtual volumes. Um, it has taken a while before the adoption uh, ramped up. I think part of that is mainly because a lot of our customer base uh, was still on uh, vSphere 5.5. Now that we're starting to see uh, broader adoption of vSphere 6.0 and uh, actually 6.5 and 6.7, we're starting to see the adoption of stuff like uh, virtual volumes go up as well. That is also due to the fact that you know our partners like Pure Storage, uh, Nimble, uh, HP with 3Part has been pushing or have been pushing uh, vVols tremendously. So they've done a great job and we're starting to see a lot of customers adopting vVols and that, you know, that way we're getting around some of the uh, limitations that we had from a traditional storage perspective. Explain that, what, what are customers telling you about the benefits that they're getting out of vVols and vVol adoption? Well there's two, uh, two main things, it kind of depends on what kind of problems you're facing but a lot of customers come to us with uh, management issues and scalability issues. From a scalability perspective, we have larger customers that literally have thousands of volumes um, if you look at an E6 cluster today, you're limited in terms of the numbers of volumes you can connect to a cluster. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. As soon as they start moving to uh, vVols, now they're not managing um, those individual volumes anymore, but they're managing the storage system as a whole and they start creating policies. And that's where the management aspect com comes mm -hmm. into play. So it becomes a lot easier to manage because instead of having you know, thousands of volumes to select uh, from, they don't no longer need to look, look at a spreadsheet, for instance, to uh, figure out where to place a virtual machine. Now they simply pick a policy and the policy engine will figure out where to place that virtual machine. And Sounds like cloud. <laughs> it, it actually is, um, you know, the cloud version of, of cloudified version of storage, yeah. I would say, right? right? It brings a lot of uh, benefits. And the funny thing is that we've been talking about policies and policy engines for a long time, even in the cloud, but try to figure, uh, try to come up with one cloud that actually has a decent policy engine. Hardly anyone has that today. From a storage perspective, I think the storage policy-based management framework that VMware has is quite unique. 
we're now starting to see that popping up in other areas, and that's the, the that's the str strange thing about it. Uh, back to always back to the software mainframe, Stu. Yeah, <laughs> and Duncan, one of the things we've really seen a, a transition for it took us about a decade to try to fix storage yes. in a virtualized environment. Today, most things are built either understanding virtualization, or at least that, that's part of the puzzle, and what, of course, VVOLs led us into was the ability for, for vSAN. So maybe help us kind of tr transition that threshold as to how that's just kind of a given underneath for vSAN and other solutions like it. Yeah, if you look at vSAN, it has been around for a while. The beta was in 2013, as you guys know. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a large uh, adoption, at least we saw a large increase over the last uh, couple of years, I would say the last two years. Uh, you, you guys have spoken with Yang Bing before, so you know about the, uh, the business side of uh, vSAN, I'm not going to cover that, but if you look at it from a technology perspective, we started developing this uh, 2008, 2009, that's when we started thinking about what we could do different from a storage perspective. There were already some companies doing something in the hyper-convert space, and we figured we could do something significantly different than they were doing. They had a storage solution that sat on top of the hypervisor, we own the hypervisor, so we can create something that sits within the hypervisor. And that's when we started looking at these, um, as, at, at, these as, uh, at including these different technologies. So we started looking at you know, how can we introduce things like deduplication and compression, what can we do for robo solutions, uh, can we do something like stretch clustering in an easy way. Uh, there are a lot of stretch cluster solutions out there, but if you look at a stretch clustering solution today, it typically takes weeks uh, to implement that. If you look at something like vSAN, it was our aim to actually be able to deploy something like that from a storage perspective within hours instead of weeks, right? And we've been able to, uh, to achieve that. And that has been, uh, it has been a huge undertaking, but I, you know, I think it's fair to say that it has been rather successful. All right, Duncan, help connect the dots to where we are here at Veeam on. It's, it's funny, I think Veeam started out heavily in virtualization, still heavily involved in virtualization. They got a V in the beginning of their name. When I hear the keynote this morning, a lot of hyper. Reminded me yes. of before we had hyper, before hyper converge fully took over. Uh, VMware tried to call it a hypervisor converge system around VMware. So, talk to us a little bit about data protection, uh, the, the Veeam relationship, and how that fits into things like vSAN and vSphere. Yeah, I think of uh, you know I talk to a lot of customers as a chief technologist. It's 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 part of my role to talk to customers and you know, have discussions about what's on top of their mind. Uh, data protection is always one of those things that comes comes up. I would say it's always in the top three. And whenever you talk to a CIO, a CTO, uh, protection of the data, availability of data, resiliency, reliability, it's it's it, it's fairly important. Uh, Veeam, of course, for us is a great partner. Um, Primarily because of the simplicity of the, uh, the, the features and the products that they uh, that, uh, that they offer. Whenever I talk to a customer and I explain how difficult it is to manage their backup and recovery solutions, I always point them, you know, to a partner uh, like Veeam, simply because it makes their life. It's going to make their life uh, a, a lot a lot easier, uh, if you ask me. And I can see that Veeam is slowly transitioning. Uh, you, as you mentioned, the V is in front of the name, the V is in front of our name as well. But we know that it's no, it's not. The whole world isn't just VMware, the whole world isn't just uh, virtual. There's a lot of other different solutions out there. And naturally, Veeam is looking at other revenue streams as well. I would argue, though, that if you look at something like uh, the edge space, which I think that more or less exploring, they're looking at things like IoT, there's going to be some form of virtualization uh, in that, whether that's VMware-based or another solution, of course, is going to be the question. That's something that we'll need to figure out in the upcoming uh, upcoming years, but I think there's a, there's a big opportunity out there. Uh, if you ask me, the keynote was really interesting. Um, I kind of missed miss the, um, the, the in-depth details. I'm hoping that the last, the closing keynote is going to give some more details around what they will be doing in the IoT space, how they see, you know, uh, their solution evolving uh, from, from that point of view because it's a, it's a market that's still being developed. But it, that, that's definitely going to be interesting. So Duncan, it's interesting to hear you say that, that when you talk to customers, data protection is in the top three, even amongst CIOs. It used to not be that way. Data protection was always a bolt-on, it was an afterthought, it was kind of, yeah, one size fits all. What's changed? Well, I think the uh, the importance of the data has has changed. If you look over the last uh, ten years, um, whenever you talk to to any company out there that has lost uh, any significant amount of data, they understand what the value was of the data that they were hosting. I think the big difference over the past ten years is in the past we had you know applications like email and maybe some file services and that's it. But now everything revolves around applications, and that's also the shift that that I'm seeing in the industry, uh, also from an IT perspective. Right in the past, over the past. 
over the past decade, I think everyone has been focused on the infrastructure layer. If you look at something like VBlock, very much infrastructure focused. If you look at something like Hyperconverged Solutions, very much infrastructure focused. But now whenever we talk to customers, customers are more, more or less, uh, more and more interested in what we can do for the application layer. What kind of benefits do we have uh, for Exchange, for uh, Oracle, for SAP, you, you name it. I think that's also a big change that's, uh, that's happening in the industry right now. One of the things from a tech technical perspective, uh, there, may, there may be others, but when, when VMware really became prominent, we, it, it was wonderful, but we were reducing the number of physical resources, and the one workload that took a lot of physical resources was, was backup, and then sort of Veeam swept in and took advantage of that sea change. What's the technical constraint now with, when you think about things like multi-cloud and, and SaaS and, and IOT, data's much more distributed, it's out of the control necessarily of a you know, single platform, so from a technical perspective, what, what's the big challenge and the, sort of the gate to architectures today? Uh, well, as you said, the distribution of data is the big challenge as it stands right now from a technical perspective. I think the biggest challenge that uh, most of the, uh, the players in this space, and not just Veeam, other players as well will have is trying to figure out how to control and manage, uh, manage their data. Other platforms are, are, are facing similar challenges and no one really has solved this problem yet. Uh, we're starting to see some plays in the space that have solutions that sit out in Azure, that sit out in, in Google, uh, Google Cloud. But it's a very challenging, uh, it's a very challenging solution. And I think, if you ask me, and it is something that I've said internally as well, the company that is capable of managing and owning the data is the company that's probably going to be most successful in the cloud war that's now happening. I think that's the most critical aspect. Workloads can move around, but data is very difficult to move around and own as well. Mm. Yeah. Duncan, there, there's one of the discontinuities we see in the marketplace that you mentioned earlier, wondering if you can talk to. In the enterprise and the data center, you talk, how do we get them to get to that next version? Comfortable with it, it's stable, it works. If I look at the cloud, you know, I'm running Microsoft Azure or AWS, I'm running the version that they want. How do we help close that gap? It, because from a security standpoint, from a feature standpoint, we need to move there, but uh, you know, it, it seems to be just one of the greatest disconnects we see between kind of my data center and you know, somebody else's cloud. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we had a lot of challenges in the past. I think it's fair to say with vSphere uh, 5.0, it was a great release, 5.5. Well, 5, 5 to 1, great releases. But the challenges that we had from an upgrade perspective was typically vCenter and all of the components connected to it. It's not just the vSphere platform, but if you look at the vSphere platform, the challenges that we had were all of the components integrating with it, whether that's something like VROps, um, uh, VRA, so vRealize Automation, but it could also be something like Evermar or maybe Veeam. So there were so many different components we had to take into account. So what we started doing within VMware is simplifying the architecture from a vSphere perspective. If you look at vCenter, for instance, it used to be uh, a solution where we had multiple uh, uh, functions spread out across different virtual machines. So we're now trying to bring that back into a single virtual machine again, actually dumbing it down, making it easier to upgrade. So that is something that is actively happening within VMware. And it's something that we started with 6.0. And that's also the reason uh, why we see the adoption of from 6.0 to 6.5 and 6.5 to 6.7 is at a much faster pace than 5.0. Uh, in, in, in the five code stream. So five to 5.1, for instance, took a lot longer for a lot of customers, or 5.1 to 6.0 took extremely long for a lot of customers. It's the key reason is complexity uh, from our infrastructure uh, stand. Well, we're changing, uh, changing that, and we're evolving that in the upcoming, uh, upcoming years. Duncan, as a te last question here, because we got to jump, but as the technologists, things that you're, you're looking at that are exciting to you, that you know, get your juices flowing, and yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting one, one, because it's something that I've been thinking about uh, recently. I've been doing uh, vSphere for the last, well, it wasn't even called vSphere back then, but I've been doing this for the last 12 years, virtualization, 13 years, maybe something like that, uh, at least as a consultant and then as a, as a technologist and technical marketing. But recently I'm starting to look uh, more and more into the, uh, the edge space uh, for computing, IoT, I think that's a really interesting space, especially because there isn't really a significant market uh, well, there is a significant market out there, but there isn't really one player out there that really stands out. No one has really figured out uh, what, what customers would like to do with it and how uh, our 
customers are going to, uh, to use it. So the edge computing space and IoT is a really interesting uh, thing, and especially because of the distributed aspect. It's one of the things that uh, I've been always been passionate about, uh, vSphere clusters, which is a distributed uh, mechanism. So distributed computing is definitely uh, something that uh, has my interest. All right, if you, if you care about uh, virtualization, VMware, fo follow the Yellow Brick Road, yellowbricks.com. Duncan, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having Great me, guys. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. You're watching theCUBE live from Chicago, VeeamON 2018. We'll be right back.